also I was told that Larry performed a wedding ceremony this evening. It, Jace and Tawana were married. It's Jace and Tawana Terrell now. So congratulations to those those two. That's all the mess. The that's all the announcements I have. Uh, I'm gonna be leading our singing. <coughs> Steve Seaman has our first prayer. Coulter Buck has our last prayer. Well, thank you for being here. <coughs> Let's sing number 478. 478. Oh, I want to see him. 478. Let's sing the first and fourth verse of this, and then we'll have our first prayer with Steve leading. As I journey through this land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson glow, many arrows pierce my soul.
Father, please <coughs> strengthen our nation. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask this. Amen. I'd like to mark the song of invitation number 400, uh, 500, 584. Softly and tender. 584 will be the song of invitation. Before, before Larry brings our lesson, let's turn to number 244. No, I have 244. 244. Hold God's unchanging hand. We'll do the first and the fourth verse of this. <coughs> Time is still in swift transition. about how he's talking about a spiritual birth. 
And he explains about how I, why it was important for him to come to earth and to live the life so that he could provide salvation for the world. So if you're in John chapter 3, run your finger on down to verse number 14. Verse number 14 of that chapter, that Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Let's pause right there and try to reflect to you what Jesus is talking about. There was a time that the Israelite nation were encamped and they were being bitten by snakes. And Moses instructed them to build a brass serpent and raise that serpent upon a pole. And then he said, those of you that obey my teachings, those of you that follow after what I tell you to do and go and look upon that snake, you will not die, but you will live. So Jesus is bringing that point up. He says, hey, even so, as the Son of Man be lifted up, therefore whosoever believe on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everyone that believed Moses and looked upon the serpent they did not perish, but they lived. Likewise, Jesus has said, anyone that believes and obeys my teachings, he should not perish, but he should have everlasting life. Now verse number 16. Probably the most familiar verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse number 16 is a declaration of God's love for man. Now, how has he demonstrated that love? I want to suggest to you the five things I mentioned a few moments ago. First of all, creation, does creation demonstrate the love of God? Absolutely. There are many who look around the world today and all they see is bad things. Where our news is filled and the news media is focused on the news of, of floods and fires out of the California and the tornadoes down to the deep south. The news covers things like hurricanes and volcanoes and earthquakes. And it seems like our society, really that's all they hear. But let's stop and think how many good things have happened to us every day. Somebody put a box out here in the foyer on the table. And that box says, Thank you for blessing me more than I deserve. And isn't that true? We look around our culture today and then we see how we enjoy the sunshine and the rain. We see trees. We see grass. I planted a plant that someone gave in memory of Martha. Just last week, and already, I noticed today, it's got two little flowers blooming on it. Those are good things that we can enjoy, and then the mere beauty of this world in which we live tells us that God loves us and has given us an environment that, that is perfect for our existence. Psalms chapter 19, verse number 1. I want you to go to the book of Psalms. I want you to go to chapter 19 because we're going to go back there in just a few minutes. But right now I want us to focus on the first three verses. In Psalms 19, chapter, uh, verse number 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth His handiwork, day unto day utter speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. Verse number 3, There is no speech nor language, where their voice is not heard. The world shows the handiwork of God. <clears throat> Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talks about the love of God and provisions He makes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, He says, talks says that He maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust. There was a time the Apostle Paul was in the city of Athens and he was talking to those uh, uh, Athens on Mars Hill and he would tell them in Acts chapter 14 verse 17, nevertheless he left not himself without witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food 
and gladness. God shows His love for us in the creation. He shows His love for us as well in the written Word. Have you ever known of a parent that loves their children that did not communicate with them? Or a husband and a wife that loves their spouse and they never talk with them? When you love someone or something, you want to communicate with them. People talk to their pets because they love their pets. They talk to, some people talk to plants. I remember when I was in school down at Stephen F. Austin one semester, uh, one of the botany teachers, that the, you see him out there on the campus, he's sitting down talking to a tree. We thought he was sort of weird. But people do that. Sometimes people talk to themselves. Talking to each other indicates our love for our fellow man. Then how much more does God's message indicate God's love for us? If God expects a certain standard of our behavior, doesn't it make sense that He will tell us what that standard is? How can He love us if He expects a certain requirement of us and doesn't tell us what that requirement is? God loves us. A parent loves his children. And they warn their children of danger while at the same time telling them of their expectations, what they expect from that child. The Bible reveals to us that God, in His love for man, communicated with man. God warns us of dangers of life. And God tells us in giving us our expectations of what He expects from us in living a life for Him. Deuteronomy this time, chapter number 30. Deuteronomy 30, verses, 1, or verses 14, rather. But the Word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth, in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. The Word has been made available to you so that you can do it, he says, number 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. And that I have commanded thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. Another passage, much shorter, probably more familiar, is Psalms 119. In Psalms 119, verse 105, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Number three, in addition to the blessings of nature and the inspired Word, God has shown His love through giving us a standard of morality. What would happen if we had no standard for human behavior? If there was no guidelines, if there was no laws, if there was no restrictions, if there were no limits, we would not want to live in a situation like that, would we? Would a parent be loving if he had no standards of behavior for his children? <clears throat> the fact that God has given us a standard of living means He loves us. And He wants what's best for us. He wants us to live a life of happiness. It's a shame to see God's people not happy. To see them living a life of drudgery. God wants us to be happy. And so He sets some, some, some standards there. The standards of morality that God has given us are designed to help us do that. Now I want to go back to that Psalms 19. I said to hold your finger on a minute to go. Psalms 19. This time we're going to look down at verse 7 through 10. Now I want you to read along with me in this psalm. It tells us a lot about our behavior. Psalms 19, beginning at verse number 7. 
The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than they that go, yea, than much fine go. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. The psalmist here is talking about inside of you. He's talking about your character. He's talking about the kind of person you are and how God's love is made available to you in His teachings to cultivate that, that standard. You can go to the New Testament now, Romans chapter 13, there you will see it talks about behavior, the external. Romans 13, beginning of verse number 3, or verse number 8 rather. Verse number 8 says, Owe no man anything, but love one another. For he that loveth another hath filled the law. For this, see if this sounds familiar to you. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. God has given us a standard of living. He has given us conditions both inside, the way we think, the way we have our attitude. He has given us instructions on the external and how we treat one another. If God's standard of morality involved love, which he concludes here in Romans 13, then when you expect the one that gave that instruction would be one that loves himself, you would expect him to be one that loves us by giving us these instructions. Regarding moral behavior, he has given us a way to live, but he's also given us some warnings. Just like a parent. A parent warns their child of danger, tells them of their expectations. God has given us some expectations on how to live a moral life. He's also giving us some danger signs. He gives us warning. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. How much of our world needs to abide by that? How far do you have to go on the television screen or the movies? or some of the other music you listen to, or just conversation amongst people, and see, they need to give heed to this verse. Flee fornication. Now that's not hard to understand. Flee means you get away from it. You run from it. You turn away from it. Flee fornication. Every sin that man doth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. God has not left us without a standard of behavior. He has loved us enough to give us some guidelines, some restrictions, some teachings on how we are to live. In addition, his love is enough that he has told us what we can do to be saved. Without God's love, we've been a pretty bad fix. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 says, Sin separates us from God. How many sins does it take? We looked at some examples today, this morning, of some people in the Old Testament. How many violations of God's law did they have to do before they were struck dead? Just one. How many sins do you have to commit to be called a sinner? 
just one. Sin separates us from God. So we've got a bad dilemma here. Paul would write to the church in, in Romans, in Romans 3, uh, 6, 23. says, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23, rather. Just one sin will condemn us eternally if we're not under the blood of Christ. God has loved us enough that He has made a way that we can be redeemed from the consequences of sin. What is man to do? What are we to do to escape the consequences of sin? Well, what we need is someone to pay the debt for us. And that's John 3.16. God loved the world enough that He gave His Son. He gave His Son to pay that debt. If you still have your Bibles open, I want you to open them to Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, starting with verse number 6, and going down through verse 9. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let that soak in just a minute. Christ died for the ungodly. Godly. Who would that describe? Perhaps it would describe some of us at one time. Those that have no respect for God, those that have no allegiance to God, those that have no loyalty to follow God, the ungodly. Christ died for those people. Then he goes on to say, verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yea, for your venture for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended His love toward who? The word there is us. You. And me. God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now I want you to notice verse number 9. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. This morning, we saw three examples of God's wrath toward those that disobeyed His commandments. Do you see verse number 9? Verse number 9 tells us that we can be saved from that wrath. There is a way God has loved us enough that He has made a way in which we can be spared that wrath of God. And it's through Him, through Jesus, Jesus the Christ, because of the blood that He shed. Being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. What a marvelous promise this is. God loved us enough He made a way that we can avoid the wrath of God. And we saw that this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Herein He loved, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. God loved us. Fifthly and final point, God loved us enough that we can had the promise of eternal life. Because of the sinfulness of man, a Savior was necessary. And for those that accept the terms of obedience put forth by that Savior, there is a promise of eternal life. God loved us enough to provide eternal life to the righteous. See, God didn't say, not only will I not punish you, not only will I spare you my wrath, but I'll give you a place. A place where you can live for all eternity. 
See, back in the days of Noah, there were eight people that were spared because of their righteousness. And they were spared the wrath of God. They were spared the destruction of the world. But in time, they died. God said, not only will I spare you the rent, I'll pick the place where you will never die. A place of eternal life. Listen to a few promises that talks about this kind of life. Hebrews 9, verse 15. For this cause, He is a mediator of a New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Let me inject right here. Hebrews 9.15 is talking about what some people say the blood of Christ flows forward and flows backwards. See, Hebrews 9.15 takes care of Noah as well. It takes care of Moses. It takes care of Abraham. David, all those great people on the living under the law of Moses, the blood flows back to them. Listen very carefully to what it says. It says, He is the mediator of a New Testament by means of His death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament. Those people that lived under that first law, it says, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Those people that complied and kept that law, when Jesus' blood was shed on that cross, it flowed backwards to take care of them. It flows forward to take care of us. The blood of Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth wherein dwell righteousness. According to His promise, there's going to be a new place to live. A new home. A new dwelling place. 1 John 2, verse 25. And this is the promise that He has promised us even eternal life. Today we've looked at the nature of God. He is aware of our sinful nature. He is aware of our failures. He has provided a way for us to escape punishment of sin. However, He expects us to be in compliance with His teachings. In order to receive that promise, He expects us to be obedient to Him. This morning we noticed how disobedience, those people were punished because of their disobedience. Let us always recognize and appreciate and honor and respect the love of God in our lives. God loves us. He doesn't want any of us to be lost. He sent His Son. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. We're going to close with this thought. This is one of my favorite passages. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning of verse number 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. He is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Question for the evil. Is that describing you? Are you doing what you need to do to be in obedience to the Lord? Perhaps there's some that never even become a New Testament Christian by being obedient to the gospel message. And it tells you, believing in Jesus, the Son of God, repenting of the sin in your life, <coughs> Acknowledge your faith that 2,000 years ago that was a tremendous commitment. Many people lost their life acknowledging their faith in Jesus. <clears throat> Not quite so severe today. 
But the Lord accepts that nonetheless. Be baptized because of the sin problem. That sin, Isaiah 59 2, separates you from God. There's a barrier. To bridge that barrier is done through the blood of baptism, the blood of Christ. Maybe you've not done that. Maybe you need to do that. If you have done that, perhaps you made shipwreck of your faith. That commitment is not there. That spark is gone. I don't know where you are spiritually, but tonight, if there's something missing, you can make it right. And so we're going to encourage you, if you need to respond in a public way to the Lord's invitation, to come when we stand together and as we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.
giving us the opportunity to be able to come here and learn a little bit more about your word and sing praise to your name. Bill, just please be with us as we go out to the world this week. Bill, just please help us to be a, be a shining light. And Bill, just, just be a good, good example for everyone and try to bring in people of Christ to the gospel again. Bill, just please be the same part number. Bill, just if it be your will, put it in terms of their health and the Bill, just please be with us as we go to our homes. So Bill, just please let us all get there safe. Cross that for a Take care of some songs.